If you haven't gotten your copy of Bare Naked Bravery, How to Be Creatively Courageous, then head on over to Amazon right now. It could be on its way to your house or into your device before I'm done introing this next episode. If numbers and data kind of make your eyes roll and blood boil, then today's episode is for you. (laughs) I recognize that not every person wants to dive headfirst into a spreadsheet. However, sometimes numbers can be a really easy way to make decisions and plan for your future, especially if your future involves a season of bravery sometime soon. And that's most likely you if you're listening to this show. (laughs) If you're one of our new community members and haven't heard the phrase season of bravery before, then let me illuminate (laughs) this for you. A season of bravery can be anything from the year you get divorced to the year a family member has to go through chemo treatment. It could be even promotions at work or seasons of really awesome, prolific creativity. Seasons of bravery is a really broad definition for explaining that in the next several months, you'll need to be doing a lot of brave things. For some of us, I'm mainly pointing a finger at myself, (laughs) it seems like every season is a brave season. So if you're a longtime listener of the show, then you'll know that I routinely go through a season of bravery ritual about every quarter or so. I recently recorded a workshop which is available on my website, where I walk you through this ritual process step-by-step to map out goals and dreams and action plans. It's the same exact thing that I do for me, um, but I walk you through each of these steps so that you can plan your season of bravery for yourself. It's self-paced and you can get it and it's hosted online in our members area. And you can get it by going to emilyannpeterson.com forward slash workshops. Okay, so why am I going on and on and on and on and on all about this? Because in that ritual workshop, I mentioned going through the previous year's numbers so that we can plan for the next year's numbers. So this could be bank account numbers, the number of miles driven, the number of goals that you've attained, all the races you won and possibly failed or lost, all the articles you wrote, anything, and basically it's anything that you can measure the quantity or quality of from the previous season of life. And like I said, we then use some of these numbers to look forward into the next season of bravery so we can make plans and have expectations that are attainable and measurable and really effective and intentional, basically. Okay, so I asked Ashley Armstrong, who is a leading Amazon seller strategist. She basically helps companies create really amazing results on Amazon and uses a lot of data to do so. So I asked her to come and talk about how she uses numbers to guide her people to make the right choices. She's awesome at what she does. I even consulted with her a little bit on my book, and so and she had some really killer awesome feedback for me as an author because she's an author too so all her links are available in the show notes of this episode including a bunch of freebie stuff that she's provided to all of us so go check those out i really recommend you do that so basically she has learned the science of reading numbers like a really good novel because numbers are stories they tell stories and she uses this science to advise her clients precisely which products that your future or their future customers are looking for. It's things like she can spot the fact that people are looking for lavender scented deodorant and then find exactly the right person and manufacturer to provide that need to those customers. So she's basically able to read these numbers and just make things with just the numbers alone. It's pretty amazing. So her wisdom and her drive is something that I know that we could all use a dose of from time to time. I'm so happy that she is with us today. She and I are going to discuss all of this stuff and so much more. So I want to remind you again, that numbers tell stories. So if you're the type of person that rolls your eyes at the thought of quote unquote reading data points, (laughs) then I really challenge you to stay engaged in this one. Trust me, this is going to be a really good one. Ashley and I bring these numbers straight into home base. Let's jump on in. You're listening to Bare Naked Bravery, a weekly podcast hosted by me, 
Emily Ann Peterson. As a singer-songwriter, author, teaching artist, and creative entrepreneur, I encounter some really fascinating stories. I'm on a mission to reveal the depth and width of bravery and its benefits to creatives like yourself. More than ever today, our world needs bravery, unique bravery, from everyone. This is the place where you find it. There is no script or censorship today because that's how these facets of bare naked bravery are in real life. So if you're listening with little ears nearby, please know that some episodes may contain mature language and subject matter. One of the easiest ways you can share bravery with the world is to send this episode to a friend or two. Send them an email, text, or tweet. Tag them in one of my Instagram posts. My handle is Emily Ann Pete. Or leave us a review on iTunes. It takes seconds and can be done from your phone right now. Again, we need more bravery in the world. So let's be brave together. Are you ready for some bare naked bravery? Absolutely. Let's do this. Okay, I'm really excited about this because we're going to be talking about numbers and how those numbers can help us be brave. We're trying this new thing, you know, since I launched my book, I'm trying a new thing where we're like mapping out what each episode is going to contain, or at least like some sort of intention, because I wanted to just be a little bit more intentional with our guests. And so I'm really excited that you're here today because I know that numbers are your forte and I'm excited. Awesome. I'm excited to be here. So thanks. Yeah. So give us a little bit of background about who Ashley Armstrong is and possibly why you think you were nominated for the Bare Naked Bravery show. <laughs> oh my God, that's seriously a loaded question. Are you serious? <laughs> yep, <laughs> I'm serious. Like 24 hours? No. Yep, pretty much. <laughs> okay, who's Ashley? Well, you know, I'm a chick who happens to be Canadian and transplanted to Cabo, Mexico. I like to travel a bunch. And because of having sort of that lifestyle and different homes and being in third world countries, technically, if you want to call Mexico that, but you can't really, you know, do work per se, unless you figure it online. So Ashley was one of those individuals who went back to school, who started a family kind of thing. And lo and behold, I'm just like, how the hell am I supposed to, you know, be a good example for my children? So I wrote six children's books about my girls and published them. And that basically opened up my eyeballs to the world of Amazon, which is my massive forte. So I help companies, celebrities build and launch products on the largest distribution platform in the world, which happens to be Amazon.com. And that's kind of like a very small chunk of who I am. More than that, it just might get boring. (laughs) Oh, whatever. Okay. So I I do want to get into some of the other stuff because I know, because that is important and it does inform how you found this niche for yourself. But can you give us a little bit? I mean, I find it really fascinating. So here I am, I'm on my book tour right now and I'm showing up at all of these mom and pop bookshops. Basically all of the compet all of the teeny tiny competitors of Amazon. And so I'm feeling it's just really kind of bizarre to be talking to somebody who's has this forte and like basically playing the game of, you know, the, the big guy. And I'm just came from this really precious little bookshop here in Mississippi. And so I just find it really fascinating that we're like got both sides of the spectrum represented yeah. here in this conversation. So, and, and both those sides really do need to continue to be represented, to be honest with you. There's nothing better than the smell of a book and touching the book and carrying the thing. You know what I mean? Like that intimate connection that you have when you're like, it's there in your hands. And for me, cause I have younger children, when I take them into like chapters when we go to Canada and they like our number one stop where we always spend at least 500 bucks or, or more to keep, you know, put it in the bag and travel with us is they go bonkers. They can go in there and they can like find all these amazing books from all these different places. And it's not this internet thing, you know what I mean? Where you have no idea what you want, but you're only going to get certain amount of like, you know, suggestions or whatnot. But when you walk into a bookstore, it's like you go into like, you know, like little Harry Potter world, you know what I mean? Like it's a whole yeah. experience in itself. Well, one of the neat parts about this book tour is that it's, I'm showing up in all of these book communities, basically. It's not just a yeah. bookstore, it's a book community. And so the people who also love that little bookstore are showing up to 
hear me sing and hear me perform and then also read the, some of my book and talk about all of that. So it, it, you're right. It's something that I, one of the reasons why I'm doing it and rather than just sticking on with Amazon, but one of the reasons why I'm make, sticking my neck out and doing something bizarre like a book tour is because it is important that we do stay connected with our fellow community and like get the sweat and the smell of books and dust and all yeah. that. Absolutely. And the people too, you know what I mean? Like when you have people like coming up to you and like re- kind of like, re- you know, regurgitating like what you wrote down or some of your thought process or something and how it helped them or something along those lines. And you have that physical opportunity and that space with them. Like that's like a whole other awesomeness, <laughs> you it know, is. to the real world. Well, and you know, since we we're talking about numbers, this is like one of the things that this is, is basically the in-person data collection Absolutely, is sometimes a lot more informative than just a spreadsheet of numbers. Yeah. You're a real person at that moment and your customer or client or supporter is also a real human being. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like you say, like the numbers are amazing on the spreadsheet, but sometimes the tangibility of it can make it all worthwhile for sure. Totally. I mean, one of the things that just happened today was that, you know, there's this small, beautiful little audience. And as, you know, I'm performing, I'm singing songs, I kind of have tabs on the people in the audience and what they're doing and where they're looking and like how they're engaging with the piece of music that I'm performing. And a spreadsheet would not be able to tell me that the person sitting in the middle cushion on that couch is falling asleep. (laughs) Right. You know? Absolutely. And that's the beautiful dance. Cause like, you know, we're talking about numbers today, which is like ridiculously important. Like I tell people like they're just idiots half the time, <laughs> you know, when it comes to my, you know, my professional space or whatnot, but putting together both sides of that coin, you know what I mean? You know, as you're saying, you would never be able to understand, you know, how your customer is thinking, feeling, moving, interacting, using your songs or your written words or anything along those lines, unless you're physically there able to witness it. So it's like, you can't do one or the other, really. The, for the whole thing to really work, it's kind of a bit of both, which is why like Facebook Lives are so awesome. You know, people are like, oh my God, you're a real person and I love following you and hearing the, you know, the shit that you're saying. You know what I mean? That makes them a little bit more tangible. You know, obviously not the same as if you're sitting in the room with them because you can't see your audience in that, you know, aspect. But yeah, it's uh, numbers are important, but there's two sides of that coin. <laughs> right. Well, so give me a little insight into how you fell in love with numbers or at least using numbers to inform your next decisions. Yeah. You know, honestly, I suck with numbers. I'm like the worst person when it comes to like school and math and all the other fun stuff. But where I found my like little niche, you know, everyone has many gifts or geniuses or, you know, whatever you want to call it. But as much as, you know, growing up slightly afraid of like what numbers really mean. And sometimes when you like look at how much money you've spent that month. They like those numbers tell a story. And sometimes you just don't want to look at them because you're too afraid of like, you know, what it's going to say about your bank account or your spending habits or whatnot. You know what I mean? Yes. Coming to where I'm at now, I finally had an opportunity to have a love language with the numbers, but there's also a whole bunch of that emotional, tangible, just human nature aspect when I'm analyzing numbers now. So I can kind of work with both of them. Mm -hmm. And I found that has really worked very well for me. So as an example, you know, my godfather is a bean counter for like the Canadian government who goes after really, really big corporations and, and whatnot. And he is so analytical that he just can't like look up and see the beauty around him. You know what I mean? Like it's just so cut and dry, black and white, you know, there wasn't, there is no gray area in there. And I'm like, I don't like, you know, like that just kind of sucks. That just doesn't work for me, but I'm also artsy fartsy. So when I can kind of take both of those sides and take, you know, and look at it. So for us is what specifically, because we're talking about Amazon here and our whole point of using Amazon is the distribution channel because they have 56 million pre-qualified shoppers and they have like 250 million members. So there's a lot of people you can kind of tap and, you know, tinker around with and kind of target your products or whatnot at, but you know, when we're going to, when I'm talking to a client and qualifying them, if they're prepared to work with us or not, or even if we're creating a product from scratch for a celebrity or something along those lines, because they already have an audience, 
-hmm. we have to go in there and the numbers, you know, we have proprietary tools where we can kind of see the trending revenue and the trending unit sales a month for our competition with the other sellers. And then there's all these like ways where we can pull sales velocity and what's going on here and then the search terms and you know how many people are looking a month and where are they looking or you know are they what platform are they on and what's your reach on that platform so we have all these numbers coming out of everywhere and you almost have to do a little bit of a dance with it because it's just like just because those are the numbers you have to think about it as a real human being it's like as an example t all right, let's just say a product is tea. Okay. And tea can do about between, of course, very, very small, about $3,000 a month to about $20,000 a month on Amazon. And that's not one company, that's multiple companies who range in that, you know, three to 20,000. And basically, when we're looking at Amazon pages, so if you type something in and, you, and Amazon kind of shows you a listing of a whole bunch or a page with a whole bunch of listings on there, you got you're usually about 16 to 20 listings. So it really depends on what category you're in. But between those 16 people, there's a very large range in revenue. So you're looking at these numbers, you're like, hmm, is there too much competition? Like tons of people are making tons of money. Or is one person making money and no one else making money, which means there's an open space for us to get in there? Or does it mean that one, that one person who's making money happens to be super brand dominant? You know what I mean? Like, you know, Scotchgard. You know, everybody knows Scotchgard and everyone buys Scotch tape. <laughs> you right. know, and Kleenex, you know, Kleenex is like, it's so branded. We call the product Kleenex and that's actually a branded product. So when we when we look at the numbers, we also have to look at it from like a human perspective and kind of take a little bit out of it. And being like, okay, so like, what is, what do these numbers really mean? You know what I mean? Like, is this a hole in the market where we can kind of get into? And then, you know, you know, the search volume, like, do we have enough people looking for this type of product in a month? You know, there's no point in selling something if nobody wants it. You know what I mean? So the numbers will tell us that. Yeah. I was the other day I was watching like a little mini documentary on jump rope, specifically double Dutch and what you're talking about right now, it reminds me of double Dutch where you've got like basically the, the market or your environment or your constraints are going at a certain rhythm. Right. And you, in order to participate in that environment or in that marketplace or in that industry or whatever we're talking about, or in that relationship by analyzing and looking at and sensing the rhythm of those numbers that can inform you when you can take action and make a move or join the party or ask the pop the question or, you know, whatever. So absolutely, I think that I, I hear you saying, I mean, all, a lot of this is like Amazon heavy jargon, which I jive off of. I love it kind of stuff, but it's also the way that you are using numbers is a similar way that we can listen to our relationships and jump in and choose to engage each other based on the constraints or the the rhythms of what else is going on in our environments. Absolutely. You know, like the biggest, the number one thing, if you break it down to the bare minimum, you know, and not everyone's going to really correlate with this because not everyone is entrepreneurs. Like you and I were both entrepreneurs. We're crazy as entrepreneurs. You know. <laughs> we're artsy, fartsy. We're like got our fingers in as many pots as possible. And that's beautiful. And that's not for everybody. But the thing is, is that every relationship is a business partnership. And all you have to think about is, okay, if I'm going to go into business with this person, are they going to do what their genius is, their strength? You know, if you're going to come into a relationship, one person can be like the marketing person and one person can be like the accountant. You know what I mean? That makes a really good match. You know, one's going to be selling and one's going to be taking care of the mundane day-to-day stuff. That's a great relationship as long as they follow through and as long as they're constantly in communication and they're letting each other know what's going on and they support each other and all that other crap you know, yeah. come down the come down the pipe. And if you take the exact same concept and go to like your husband or your spouse or your boyfriend or your girlfriend or whatever it might be, and you go, what I want to be in business with you, are you pulling your fair share? Is this company going bankrupt or are we going to be able to get to the next level? What can we possibly do to expand, you know, our love or, ex- you know, expand our business? You know what I mean? So it kind of really correlates in the exact same manner. So when you're looking at business and products and being brave and, you know, just owning your shit and, and, and fessing up to it and, you know, making sure that you're, you're right in there with, with the know-how. It's a really nice correlation when you kind of like just break it down to like the nuts and bolts of yeah. 
you know, what ends up being, I guess, brave and everyone has their own thing on it. Let me ask you this. So do you ever slash how often do you get overwhelmed by the sheer amount of numbers and data that you have? Oh crap. A lot. Most definitely. Probably more than most people only because they're not my like forte. I do not rise to the occasion with numbers unless it's like money in my bank account. I'm like, woo, <laughs> let's go party or something along those lines. But when it comes to the numbers aspect, sometimes you can kind of get blindsided. You know, as I was saying before, when you aren't taking responsibility for your actions and then you finally like add up your month's worth of crap you've been paying for. And then you realize like, holy shit, did I really spend that much at Starbucks or something along those lines? You know what I mean? Right. So I definitely do get anxiety kind of thinking about it. Generally, you know, not really thinking about it, but it really kind of depends. I've heard going for like business stuff and accounting stuff down like, oh my God. And then if I'm looking at, you know, client stuff and helping clients, it jacks me up. I'm like super, super excited because I'm like, I can look at something and like very quickly analyze if this is a good move or this is a bad move. This is a good product or bad or good category or not a good category to sell in or something along those lines. So the anxiety or the stress about the numbers was really prevalent in the beginning of my business, I guess you could say. And over the years, I have, I've owned it. Like I've stepped up to the plate going, holy shit, I'm having a panic attack right now. Help, someone help me calm the F down to working my way through that, realizing it's coming on, understand that every time I have an anxious moment, it's actually literally me kind of having that, you know, when you sometimes just have to cry to get it off your chest, whether it's good or bad. And sometimes you just have to scream to get it off your chest, whether it's good or bad. It's kind of like that moment where I'm a snake shedding my skin, where I'm freaking the fuck out about whatever situation might be. And then once I come out of it, I'm on to the next step of whatever my game is. It's literally my body and the universe telling me, all right, all right, girl, buckle the fuck up because you are stepping up to the next level. You're ready. Right. This is scaring the shit out of you. And now you're ready to move up to the next level. You know what I mean? So I've really correlated my anxiety or my stress points that kind of come when I'm looking at numbers, whether it's business or, you know, whatever it might be. And now I can control it. I can see when it's coming on. I look at it. I'm like, okay, I know what you are. I know what this is. This is awesome. I'm going to be doing so good. Something good's coming down the pipe. You know what I mean? So like now I've really switched that and reprogrammed, you know, the synopsis in my brain basically to try to change something that was really negative. And I still definitely get it, of course, and some days are obviously better than um, others, but I've been able to switch it around and be like, this is good shit. It's okay. Yes. You know? Yeah. I was listening to Brene Brown's audio series basically on rising strong as a spiritual practice. That's the title of the audio series. And she talks about embracing the suck and how she was, I think it was, she was doing some consulting for West Point, which is actually just down the street from where I'm staying right now, (laughs) but she was doing some consulting for West Point and they were going to do a big celebration after she did a day of training with them. And the celebration was to run a 5k. (laughs) So, So she was like, well, I guess I better learn how to run a 5k. And she, as she was doing the training, she was like, well, this is awful. And there must be a trick. There must be something that I'm missing. She called her contact at West Point, asked him like, Hey, what am I missing here for training for this 5k? And he was like, Oh, you just have to embrace the suck. It's going to suck. Like (laughs) it's going to suck. And that's part of it. Like that is part of it. So I think in, in some regard, like when you're, when you're dealing with overwhelm, especially when it comes from an overwhelming amount of information, even just like an overwhelming amount of information. Sometimes it's okay to just acknowledge how overwhelming it is. Absolutely. And that's kind of like the shed the skins, the snakes shedding the skin going like, okay, wow. Okay. This is me being honest. This is a little bit overwhelming, but I know I want to take the next step. I know I want to finish this 5k. Absolutely. My husband comes home from the gym and he's like, I love feeling in pain. My muscles hurt. This is the best shit ever. I love it. I love it. And I'm like, okay, buddy. And then like I do Pilates, you know, work out and I'm kind of getting into it. And we're both like, oh my God, I'm in so much pain. It's awesome. <laughs> Having conversations like that, you're like, what are you talking about? Like, oh dude, you're just at the gym. <laughs> that is so funny because that is absolutely not my preference. <laughs> not mine either, but we're embracing the suck. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Totally. I think I might need to embrace the suck more often in that regard. But my next question is, 
what is the next step after you're really overwhelmed by the sheer amount of numbers? Like how do you kind of do triage with these numbers? How do you pick which numbers are the most important? Well, if you kind of break it down before we kind of even get to, you know, what it really obviously depends on the perspective as to what the hell are we talking about and what numbers and the relevancy and everything else like that. But if you just kind of just really take it back, you know, to the whole premise, the whole point of life is, is that we're constantly learning skills. We're never going to stop learning until we're dead. Hopefully that's going to be like a hundred years or something along those lines. And when we don't know something, either we nowadays, because we have obviously the internet and everything else, which is fabulous, we can research it, we can look for it, we can find videos, we can find written work, and or we can find specialists in that field. And if you don't know something, then get some freaking help about understanding it. And the same thing goes for numbers, you know? So if I freaking suck at like my accounting and like balancing my shit for my business or whatever, what am I going to do? I'm going to go get myself a bookkeeper. I'm like, that's your genius. Take care of my shit because my genius is over here. I need to focus on this. This is what I'm good at, you know? Mm -hmm. And so the same thing comes into like numbers for my business, you know? It's just like, okay, so, you know, break it back to whatever. When I talk to my clients, they desperately need me because they're just like, we have five products, 50 products, thousands of products, 20s of thousands of products. And we want to launch, you know, on this particular platform, but we don't know what to go with first. We don't know what's a good idea, you know, or not a good idea. Or I talk to people and they're just like, I have this wonderful idea and I make it in my house, which of course is awesome because I've always been a homemaker myself. Or, you know, I have this product and it's amazing and people should want it. And I'm just like, dude, no one wants your shit because no one knows it exists. Do you have a hundred thousand dollars for marketing? No. Okay. Well then let's focus on how we can find you a hole in your market. Let's find out who your audience is. What are the things that they're looking for already? How can we better what is already out there and give people what they want? Mm -hmm. And then after you have an audience, you can introduce something completely brand new to them because you already have people listening to you. So the numbers are really cut and dry. When I talk to my clients, I'm just like, look, no one knows what your product is. Nobody knows what it is. No one's searching for it. If no one's looking for it, how the hell are you supposed to sell it? You know, you have to beat them over the head with the stick so they can learn about this new gadget or this new thing or whatever. So those numbers are really important to be looking at it from, you know, both sides of the coin, you know, and business and, you know, in life, really. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, I, especially from what I know about Amazon, what I find really fascinating is that a lot of times... I'll say us because I do this, I do this still too, is us creatives want to put a creative name to our product or our thing or our project or whatever. And that name actually shoots us in the foot. Totally. They're like, what do you do? Or what are you used for? Or what? (laughs) Absolutely. Right. Or it's like if you have, if you're selling a package of pencils with like original artwork on the pencil, on the outside of the pencils, but you call it the didgeridoo thingies, then that's not, that's not actually helping you sell those things. It's a cool, funky little name, but it doesn't tell people what the thing is. And yeah, I see so many times that people end up, I guess, tying their heart to the name of the things or they tie their heart to oh, the numbers yeah. at the beginning. And yeah. then it tanks the whole thing because they aren't. It really does. Yeah. They're not like, I, I see it that they're not willing to do what it, what it takes. Yeah. But do what the market is dictating as being the best step forward. Yep. Absolutely. And I, and it sounds bad to kind of say this, but I choose to not work with people who are in love with their idea Mm. or in love with their product. Now, of course, there's two sides to that coin. Of course, I want someone super passionate about what they're doing because that's just going to make everything better, no matter what. That's just kind of a given. But when people are madly in love with a product, let's just say, and they think it's the shit and everyone's going to like agree with them, they can't take any suggestive or supportive criticism or anything along those lines or just, you know, like the numbers, like these are your numbers. Nobody is looking for a glow in the dark spatula. Okay. People know what spatulas are, but they're not looking for a glow in the dark one. (laughs) You know what I mean? So when people are loved, they're just tunnel vision, like a horse with blinders on. So what would be a good symptom or what would be some good like red flags for somebody to see if they have tunnel vision for their own projects or whatever? 
That's a really great question. And I think a lot of people, depending on obviously the market they're in or whatever it is they're doing, it can even be like too much passion for a spouse that doesn't treat them right. well. You know what I mean? Like, and obviously I'm not going to go down that road, but if you kind of take it to the far left, you could definitely say that. Right. First and foremost, I do a constant check on me, like self-assessment. I grew up in an Olympic family. And so when it came to training as a pro athlete in the whole nine yards, it was always about you have to be able to project yourself out of your body, watch you while you're doing your sport, your run. I was a downhill ski racer. I'd have to physically see what I'm doing, where my hands were, where my knees were, my feet, my ankles, like the whole nine yards, as if I'm like watching myself, like, you know, I'm kind of dead kind of thing. Yeah. And I have to like detect and correct and criticize the crap out of myself. And I find that the people who are, aren't willing to put themselves underneath their own microscope and hold themselves accountable for their own crap or their own decision, poor decisions, good decisions, whatever it might be, that's kind of like the very first checkpoint. It's just like, do you self-criticize in a good way? Like, I mean, as in like, you know, you're supposed to be going to the gym. Why haven't you gone? And I was supposed you know, I haven't gone to the gym in like six months. I'm just like, I want to go, I want to go, I want to go, I want to go. And finally I hit the bottom, like, okay, get off your butt and go back to the gym because you feel amazing when you're in there. You, you know, like you bounce when you walk, you have so much more energy, you eat more, you drink more because otherwise I'm just like, you know, withering away and getting like all old or whatnot. And I know better, but I just don't do it. You know what I mean? Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? So when you kind of take it, you know, in that kind of aspect, it's just like, can you detect and correct yourself first and foremost. And if people are willing to kind of take the blinders off, then they would have the opportunity to see like, okay, I'm too in love with this because I'm not allowing anyone else to give me their opinions. Or if someone gives you an opinion and you immediately shut that down, or if you ask someone for help and they go to help you or give you the opinion to help you, and then you just do the opposite or you don't even take their advice. And if you're constantly asking for help, but you keep closing the door, the universe is going to shut it off, man. They're not, the universe is going to keep providing you opportunities and options and people. If you keep just slamming the door on the truth and the truth could be anything. Yeah. We'll get back to the bravery at hand in a second, but I wanted to remind you that I first began having these conversations both on and off the podcast because I was curious about what bravery actually meant if we could build it, if so, with what ingredients. And I was so curious, I turned my research and personal stories of experiences with feats of bravery into a book. That book is called Bare Naked Bravery, How to Be Creatively Courageous. And it's now available in multiple formats on Amazon right now. So go get yourself a copy of Bare Naked Bravery, How to Be Creatively Courageous. And after you read it, let me know what you think. So let's say that somebody has, let's, I guess we'll use some numbers again. So let's say somebody has fallen in love with their product. They have put it out there and they find that, oh gosh, wow, I really fell in love with this product. I put it out there and now I've kicked myself while I'm down basically. And now here I am, I need to make some changes. When you know that you need to make changes, How do you decide with Amazon, with using numbers, how do you decide which change to do first? That's a really great question. Again, of course, there's obviously different scenarios based on the situation that we're in, but just kind of an overview on how do you... Well, I've actually done this before. I invested in a massively huge product, huge investment, and it was amazing. It was going super, super good. And then I had manufacturing problems where we were like held up for like three months and all this other crap ended up happening. So what ended up happening is I had about $100,000 worth of product that I had to dispose of because I couldn't move it because I had, there's a whole bunch of backstories, which we're obviously not going to get into. But the long story short is I did the numbers. I did the research. I was fucking right. I sold a gazillion of these freaking things. And then I had a blip in my logistics. And because of that blip, I got totally taken over and like kicked in, the, <laughs> kicked in the lady balls, I like to call yeah. them the women's ovaries, for making the poor judgment on changing factories and changing my distribution channel on that. And sometimes the best thing is, is what is the heaviest thing? You just have to kind of take sort of like a stock of inventory. What is the heaviest thing? Or make a list. Like I have one of my business coaches is like one of the best guys in Western Canada. And the number one thing he just says is like, Ashley, okay, make a list of all the most important things in your life that you have to do. And then there's a list for business, there's a list for family and you know, the whole nine yards. 
And it's just like, that list can be 50 things long. It could be 25 things long. It could be whatever it is. Like the most important things that you have to do every single day, you know, like that you have to do check emails or go here, you know, find this supplier or find a new client, you know, whatever it might be, girlfriend, boyfriend, find a job. I don't know. Mm -hmm. And then he goes, okay, this is awesome. Now you're expecting me to ask you to explain it all. I'm like, yeah. He's like, hell no, I don't want to know that shit. That's just ridiculous. I want you to pick the three. Pick the most three. If you were held up in a hospital from a big car accident and you had no energy, no bandwidth, no nothing, what are the three most important things on that list that you have to do no matter what? And once we start doing that, nine times out of 10, You fix or you do or you execute or finish or whatever it might be, one of those three tasks, if you had a list of 20 items, doing one of those three tasks will knock out seven items off your list instantly. It's just like a freaking domino effect. It's like boom, 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 or it doesn't matter. It got taken care of on itself or or whatever it might be. It just... It's like the universal flow. You know what I mean? It's just the rule of the the land. It's just focus on the most important three things. Because those are the things that are going to keep your life going, alive, breathing. Everything else really actually doesn't matter. You just kind of think it matters. So just so I can play this out. So like, let's say I'm unemployed and I have to pay rent tomorrow and the groceries need to get bought and my child's daycare bill is coming in and it's just like a bunch of bills coming up. The most important thing might be or three, the three important things might be pick my child up from childcare, <laughs> find a job and eat and get some food because by getting some food, then that means you are ready to eat for the next seven days. By finding the job, that means you're guaranteed to pay your rent for the next however many months um, and pick the daughter up. That means that her physical safety is taken care of. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, absolutely. You know, so like when you're asking, you know, like, how do you know what to kind of get rid of first? Sometimes it's going to, it's kind of doing the opposite because a lot of times people are always looking at the negative or focusing on the negative and that just like, woe is me. And it just makes it worse. Yeah. So if you can just think on like the three most important things that needs to kind of be done, then you're going to know what the dead weight is. You're going to know because you're making your list. You know what I mean? And then when you execute those three things, the dead weight's going to automatically be cut off. You're going to know that, okay, I love this product and it was great, but now I have to give away a hundred thousand dollars with a product that I can't do shit with. That's a shoot to yourself in the foot kind of thing. But the thing was, is that I just wrote it off. I'm like, I'm not going to pay for storage. I'm not going to deal with this. I'm not going to worry about whatever. I'm going to, you know what I mean? Like just trying to find anyone, you know, like you just go through this ramble of stuff. Yeah. And then all of a sudden I'm just like, I've cut my losses. It's a write-off. It's where it is. I donated a bunch of stuff to shelters and this and that, whatever. And as soon as I did that, it alleviated so much time and so much energy that the most important things that needed to be done got done. And because of that, I ended up actually prospering because I just no longer had that anchor. I didn't have that stress or that worry. You know what I mean? So the numbers will tell you when to cut and the numbers will tell you when to run and when to jump. And when you like kind of switch the flip beat a little, you know, just switch it around a little bit and you don't look at the negative side, you look at the positive side of what can be done. It just automatically takes care of the negatives crap too. Mm -hmm, It doesn't mm -hmm. happen all the time, obviously, but it's something that we like to live by. I would say that when it comes to money and, or like business, like looking at the numbers of your business, let's just say the most important number might be profit. Yes. Like profits first. That is like an excellent book. Right. And so if you're focusing on the top three things, profit, expenses, and I don't know, pick any of systems. Other systems. Yeah. Systems. So profit, expenses, and systems. So if you focus on profit, then that means that a lot of the other tiny details of exactly how much profit or how many things do I have to sell in order to make X, Y, Z profit? Like those answers are already given to you. If you just know that those are your three most important numbers. Yeah, absolutely. And then the other thing is if you look at it from like a consulting point of view, it's just like, okay, how do we get the most profit? So you're like, okay, expenses. So cut down on the expenses that you don't necessarily need, but how do you get more profit? Well, the best customer is an existing customer. So you start charging your existing customers more. 
And then more customers will come in because you're, you know, you're over providing, giving them 110% of what they need. You're able to up your prices with them. They've been with you. They understand they're not, you know, not going to go away. You don't have to like justify yourself by any stretch of the imagination. So it's like, if you want to make more money, just charge more for the people that already know you. And then with that, you work on the referral systems and the word of mouth advertising is the best thing since sliced bread. You know, that's never going to change. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, with your list right there, it's just, it's kind of one of those things that you kind of can't screw up if yeah. you just make it so simple mm-hmm. on yourself and take out all the, I don't know what to do first. It's like, yeah, you do. Just write it down, get the shit out of your head. Well, I, I hear a lot of times, I mean, I just in the, the realm of, business that I'm in, I hear a lot of times people are, and this happens to myself too, where I wake up and go like, wait, am I actually solving a problem? (laughs) Because sometimes it doesn't feel like that. And, or it doesn't, you know, the numbers aren't telling me, oh, she's solving a problem here. Right. And that when I see that, or when I feel that I basically am doing what you're, you're saying here, which is to go, okay, go back to the important stuff. Are you solving a problem? What about these numbers are telling you that, or which numbers tell you which problem you are solving? Yes. And are you willing to accept those numbers? Because people don't accept the numbers. Right. Not at all. You know, they're just like, oh yeah, but they don't freaking accept it. You know, like, I'm just going to go buy this, but I have $200 in my account, but I'm going to be getting $2,000 next week. So it's not that big of a deal. You know, I just, you know, it's like next week, you know, I'm just going to do this now. I was like, dude, accept the fact that you shouldn't be spending that $200 until next week comes. (laughs) Delay, delay, delay gratification. Every single day you're like, I have to go buy bungee cords for my garage. Just go, I'm going to do it tomorrow. And the next day I have to go buy, you know, bungees. I'm going to do it tomorrow. And you just keep pushing off and pushing off, pushing off. And nine times out of 10, you don't even buy the damn thing or need to spend your money on it because you actually don't need it. So you give yourself that bumper room. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Well, and I was going to say like the way that that looks like for, for me and my business, even just last year, let's say, I at one point looked at all of the types of income I was making. Cause I was making a lot of different types of in- like a bunch of different streams of income. And what I saw was that my least favorite project or the one that I didn't have as much passion for anymore was the one that was making me the most consistent amount of money. Oh, isn't that hilarious? Yeah. Oh my God. And Thank so you, universe. I know. And so, <laughs> and so I was honestly, it was like, it wasn't just it was passive. It was like truly passive income that I was no longer putting energy into marketing. It was just up in a distribution site and I had titled the product the correct title. So people were looking for, were literally looking for, they didn't know it, but they were literally looking for my product. So what that told me when I was kind of like exacerbated by like, wait, am I actually solving a problem? I looked at all the array of my products and was like, well, yeah, yeah, I am solving a problem. It just happens to be a problem that I'm not really like super stoked about, but at least I know what does work. And that was what I was able to basically take action from. I was able to say, okay, well, this project, this one specific project is doing really well. So let's see if we can duplicate that over again. Absolutely. And that it's, it's so funny. And that's super awesome that you got to a point where you had money coming in, even though you, you know, didn't really want it. And the next question is, is do I turn that off or do I let that keep going? Exactly. Do I put more energy in it? Do I get reignited with it again? Because if these things aren't selling and my passion's there, sometimes I just got to, again, knock off that anchor because it's dead weight. It's ne- not going to turn into something and then switch myself over to what is actually working. Am I able to do that? Can I move a passion? Pro- you know what I mean? Like that's the questions you have to ask yourself too. Right. When you go through all those things. And what was really fascinating was that in that season, I was trying to decide, well, do I discontinue some projects or continue other projects? And when I looked at the numbers, the financial numbers, and also just like the you know, web visits and how much time and energy you also had to do too. Exactly. And I was like, okay, well, based on the number of web visits and downloads and purchases I've had of product X and also the amount of energy I haven't put into product X, that tells me that product X is my most successful product. (laughs) Yeah. Just imagine what would happen to it when he did put energy into it. Like that's the crazy part. Right. 
Right, right. Well, and but here, here's a question because this is what ended up happening. I basically was like, well, I don't personally have passion for it and I didn't actually want to put energy into it. But looking at the numbers, I was able to say, oh, okay, well, if I have to cut out one project or one product, it shouldn't be this one because it's still working. It's still making me money, you know? And so even if you don't choose to like dive into the numbers or basically what I'm saying is that it's still important that when you look at numbers, you're staying true to your desires and your passions. Absolutely. Because, and eventually like what I have seen myself do (laughs) is that you get too involved in the numbers and you don't check in with yourself Mm. about whether you're actually interested. Yeah. It's like, you can be making all the money in the world, man, but if you ain't happy, I don't know. Like that's a tough cookie. Right. Use it, leverage it to build your next passion project that hopefully will work. And since you're not doing anything that's making money, just keep using it to funnel a new project. That's what most people might do. I don't know. Is that what you did? Well, no, I, I, to some degree, yes. I mean, that's one of the things like right now I'm making, if you look at my income pie chart, basically the bulk of my income is coming from marketing consulting. However, the bulk of my energy and, you know, passion is going into music and being an author, both feed off of each other, right? So like I (laughs) get more marketing clients because I'm talking about my book and because I'm being different and musical, but basically it's like a, a give and a take, you know, like I'm not making a ton of money or an equal amount of money off of just the music by itself, mm-hmm. but the music is helping me make more money based on the marketing consulting. So it's a really interesting thing to have your, have one project consume all of your passion and yet another project support the passion. Yeah. And honestly, I think that's one of the the best kind of ways to be in, you know, like right now I'm building out two new marketing campaigns. Personally, we've been working on it for months and I'm like, oh my God, shoot me in the head at any point in time, go right ahead. (laughs) But you know, we're working on these and they're, they're kind of, they're, they're just basically it's content campaigns. They're not really going to be actually making me any money, but are building a solid foundation where I can be, you know, the authority in my space and do, you know, doing my thing and have constant interaction with the people who, you know, I'm hopefully targeting and will gain a, you know, a larger audience and everything. And I know it's not going to be making money right now, but it will later because I'm going to make sure it happens. It's like buying a house. Everyone's like, oh, I got a house. It's an asset and blah, blah, blah. Like your house is shit until it makes you money. It's not an asset until it makes you money. So, but you built the foundation to have it be an asset. You bought the house. It's in a good area. You know what I mean? Like you got your mortgage down and now you can rent it out <laughs> and now it's an asset. It's making you money. Yeah. So that's basically what you, you, know, you did. You just built your foundation because it's going to leverage you in the future. It's just when people, I guess, don't focus. Mm-hmm. And it's not abnormal for, especially in the creative world, but it's not abnormal even in the product development world. Oh gosh. No. That in a portfolio of products, one product makes the bulk amount of money You're for absolutely a right. business. And then the rest of the products are like just They're like legs holding up the table. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> you know, a little leg here and a little leg there and a little leg there, a little boost here, a little boost there. But yeah, that's absolutely it. You know, like every product I've ever launched has always been a bestseller. And then I'd add on like tier products or complementary products to that bestseller because I'm like, hey, we need to have a branded distribution line going on here. You know, I mean, like people are looking, whatever. And it's always the product that I launched that I know for a fact is going to be a bestseller is a bestseller. And all the other support products that I'm like, oh, this is going to be great. Do sh-. like they still make money, of course, but nowhere near where the number one product was the product that I initially wanted, you know, I did all the research that I knew it's going to work. It's going to have to work. I'm going to make it work kind of thing. And then all these other support ones are just like, it was kind of like wasted monies per se, but not really because it made money obviously, but you know, they're the little legs kind of holding up the number one bestseller and it, it looks good. you know. <laughs> so, I mean, all that to say, I think it's so important that when we are looking at our numbers that we are looking at all of our numbers, because if I'm just looking at just the, like the Roman numeral numbers, 
then I'm not looking at the representation of who I am as a human and where my passions lie. But absolutely. On the same token, if I'm looking at just one part of the Roman numeral numbers, <laughs> I guess Roman numeral is not the what I'm talking about, but integers, yeah. right? So if I'm not looking at the actual or all of the actual numbers, then some of the other numbers might be missing from the story. And you might be looking at just like the top left corner of a photo yes, and not seeing that like, oh, this is a picture of a mountaintop. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Rather yeah. than a picture of ocean. So as we wrap up, let me ask you this. What If somebody is interested in jumping into something new, specifically in product development or even on Amazon by itself, like what would be like the top three things you would suggest for a brand newbie in the Amazon realm? Now, that's a really great question. And this actually really kind of plays with every single one. It's just the simple fact, okay, you have a product, great. Obviously, you have to look at the numbers on manufacturing it. If those seem to be something that's justifiable, looking at what the market, competitive market's looking like, what their retail price is. And based on what you're able to do in that retail price, can you see you know, a profit margin in there? So that's like the kind of the first thing, which most companies do on their own before they even get to me. But some don't. <laughs> but most of them do. <laughs> and then the next thing is, is the numbers that we look for is just like, what are all the ways you would typically call this product or explain the product or whatever it might be. Because again, being online, it's all based on what you type in. It's whatever phrase you type in or descriptive words you type in or whatever you want to call it, which we call keywords. Is there enough people looking for that type of product? You know, I said it before, if no one's looking for what you have to sell, then I'm sorry, you're going to have to switch up your formula. So obviously you have to look at the profit margin aspect based on the competitive analysis or the competitive landscape. We have to make sure that there is enough demand in the market. There's enough people who are looking for that particular product. And then the last most important one is being able to see if there's even money in it. So if someone has, as an example, like a cat toy, that's a mouse they're like, oh, I have these great toys. I'm going to put them on my hands and sell them. And like, I go and I look and I'm like, okay, based on the proprietary tool, I can see that people who are selling mouse, little mouse toys for cats, they're only doing about $3,000 a month. In order to even get your product to page one, it's going to cost you three times that and marketing effort and you know consulting effort and all this stuff just to get your product to be making $2,000 a month. That's not sustainable. But if you happen to have catnip, I know for a fact that catnip does about $30,000 a month. There's only about four top sellers. It's not brand recognized where it's like there's one company that everybody knows, like I said, Scotchgard. And if we know for a fact that page one and four sellers are making between $15,000 and $30,000 a month for catnip, then well, by golly, you have 16 other spots that you can move your product into with a marketing campaign. That's where all the buyers are going. And we know that there is a rough revenue potential of $15,000 to $30,000 if you do the job right. That's where you focus on. And those are the three numbers is the most important aspect whenever I talk to anyone and, and really kind of put the mirror up to them. Because like sometimes when I put the mirror up, I'm like, I'm sorry, your product just it might be wonderful. You'll go to brick and mortar, go to trade shows, go to whatever. But at this very moment in time, it's just not for Amazon. And that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. Well, and, and I think what I really love about the example you just gave is that both of those products, catnip and the little mouse toy, still solve a problem for the same group of people. Mm -hmm. And if you are in it for the right reasons, then it really does I think, I mean, this is also, also a big, huge generalization. So take that with a disclaimer. <laughs> but if you're in business for the right reasons, then switching up your products because it's what your people want rather than what you want to give them. Yes. Switching up that product shouldn't be a big problem for you because- You know what the market wants. And it's the exact same thing if you look at a relationship. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, the- the four agreements or you can go into the five love languages. There's a gazillion bloody books out there that are absolutely brilliant. And it's just like, okay, the five love languages. I know that I am a person who loves to be doted on, like touched and like making sure that, you know, like they're hugged and whatever. And I also love when people look after me because I am the alpha and I look after everybody. So if someone's going to look after me, oh my God, I am so freaking happy. So it's the same kind of thing. If I know 
or if my husband knows what makes me happy and what I want, because we've had this dialogue, it's like, just do that. You know, it's going to work because this is what I want. And if I know my husband wants to have coffee every single morning, because he likes to have access service as well. If I just keep doing that, which is like same thing, selling your customers what they want, giving your husband what they want, they're just going to like recoup, you know, reciprocate. Like your husband's going to like look after you and do nice things and wow you, your customers are going to keep buying your stuff and they're going to keep coming back for more and you launch more products and they're going to buy your other launch products. So it's a win-win no matter how you look at it, business or personal, (laughs) if you just give them what people want. Right. Give the people what they want. Yeah, right? <laughs> I mean, that's a really great way to wrap all of this up, especially if you include yourself in that. Give yourself what you want oh, and yeah. in a way that you can also give other people what they want. And I think then everyone's going to be happy. And it'll be a lot. If you look at your feet of bravery in that light, then the feet of bravery will probably look a little less scary. Absolutely. You know, it's just the same comment is if you're going down on an airplane and the mask pops out in front of you, put it on yourself first because you can't take care of anybody else after that. And like the life of a mother, look after yourself first so you can look after your kids and the family the way they deserve it. Do we do it half the time? No. Why would we do that? You just, you know, keep getting more stressed or whatever (laughs) until you like wake the F up. You're like, hey, wait a minute. Me, 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 (laughs) me. Then you. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Oh, this has been so fantastic. Okay. I have loved this every little bit of it. So thank you so much for for doing this. Where can people find out more information about you and what you do? Yeah. Great question. Uh, You can go to my website, which is amazeauthority.com, A-M-A-Z, authority.com and or Facebook, which is just Amazon with Ashley. That's the easiest way to find me on Facebook. And other than that, that that's basically it. They can come say hi to you because we're friends. Yeah, <laughs> we're totally. connected now. We're connected now. <laughs> There's no way of getting away from me. <laughs> totally. And also, all of your links are going to be in the show notes for this episode. So if you guys are curious about everything Ashley related, then you can go check all of that out. And oh my gosh, Ashley, thank you so much for for being here. Well, I really appreciate it. You know, honestly, I've talked to a gazillion different business people from a lot of different aspects. And I love what you're doing for people. You know, I'm an ex natural path, so natural medicine. And then, you know, having like my background and and sports and everything along those lines. And the way that you are so you're just, you're grabbing onto this whole concept of bravery and you're, you're changing it into a form that it's really digestible for a lot of people. And you break it down to its raw form. Like when I asked you, like, what do you consider bravery? Like, what is it to you? What's your perception of it? Cause we all have different quality worlds. You're like, you know, right. I think blue is, should be this color blue. And you think blue should be that color blue. And if you actually took two pictures off the internet, we'd totally see that they're completely different shades of blue. Right. But we both think that we're talking about the same thing and we're not. You know, so I love how you break that down for your audience and how you like give them a serious backbone. You know what I mean? I think it's really cool. So thank you. Thank you. I do it because I have to do it for myself. So, <laughs> right. It's, it's sometimes we're the best motivator. That's part of the, what we were just saying is like, do something that makes you feel fed and feeds others at the same time. So yeah, absolutely. Here's to doing more of that in the world. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for having me on. I really appreciate it. This was awesome. Beyond your free bravery bundle, which is always available at emilyannpeterson.com forward slash join, your brave takeaway from today's show is to identify which numbers you might be avoiding. I want you to plan the least stressful environment to view those numbers. Maybe you go get a pedicure while you go check your bank account. And then I want you to schedule a time to make that happen. So sometimes you might even need to schedule a time to schedule that time because I've definitely been there when I've had to do that. (laughs) If you take a look at those scary numbers, then I encourage you to pop in. I'm not asking you to like draw conclusions with these numbers. I'm just asking you to look at it because one of the first ingredients of bravery is just honesty. So just be honest with yourself, look at the numbers, and then maybe if you feel like you have enough bravery, you can ask yourself what those numbers are trying to tell you. (laughs) If you do take a look at these scary numbers, then I encourage you to pop into the Bare Naked Bravery Facebook group and let us know how it went. 
if you noticed anything, if you felt anything, if the pedicure really did make a difference. (laughs) Otherwise, we always love to hear all about your favorite parts of today's Bare Naked Bravery. You can do that in our Facebook group, or you can do it on social media. You can find Ashley Armstrong and myself on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and all the other places. So go ahead and tag us so that we can cheer you on and see what you're up to. We really do love hearing about that kind of stuff. So if you are wanting to stay in touch with Ashley and have some more questions for her about Amazon, all of the expert stuff that she does, then go to the show notes for this episode. We've got all of her links available in there, including a bunch of free stuff as well. So that is our show for this week. I want you to know that we are so grateful that you have chosen this episode amongst all of the other things out there to listen to. It is so, so nice and so amazing that you've stuck through to this part. I want you to know that we really did enjoy making it for you. So if you have enjoyed the episode, then I encourage you to go to your podcast app on your phone, any podcast podcast app. All of them have review options and just leave us a review for the show. It really does help us out so much more than it is a hassle for you. And it's one of the ways that the algorithms can be spread far and wide to make sure that bravery is spread as far as wide as the algorithms can reach. (laughs) And you are a part of that. And you know what? Sometimes you don't even need algorithms. Sometimes you just need to text a friend and say, you've been struggling with your numbers. You need to listen to this episode. (laughs) Okay. If you are digging the music in today's episode, that's because it's brought to you by Lee Rosevier. And he is generously our musician for this season of the show. So to find out all about him and the other musicians and other sponsors of the show, go to barenakedbravery.com and go check out all the resources that we have there for you. I am so looking forward to being with you next week. I want to remind you that we have an awesome workshop coming up. So go to emilyannpeterson.com forward slash workshops. If you are interested in taking a live workshop with me, that's the place to go make it happen. So, okay. Until then, I'm looking forward to being with you and we have some awesome things in store like workshops and other awesome episodes coming up. So I have just one message for you in the meantime. It's this, be yourself, be vulnerable, be imaginative, be improvisational because the world needs more of your bare naked bravery.